All right, let's jump in. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing well today. We're so excited to have you joining us today for our webinar, Pride Year Round, Applying UX Research to Create Inclusive LGBTQIA Plus Work Experiences. My name is Lynette, and I'm part of the team here at Answer Lab. And before we start, I just want to run through a couple of quick housekeeping items. So this webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive a recording via email afterwards. So if for any reason you have any connectivity issues or you're disconnected, no worries, we'll make sure that you still receive this content. If you have any questions you'd like to submit, please do so via the Q&A box at the bottom or top of your screen and we will do our best to answer them at the end of this discussion. We are gonna do our best to keep this to 45 minutes so you can stay on track for the rest of your day. A little bit about us. Answer Lab helps brands bring a human-centered design process to every product we launch. We focus on user experience research to understand what people see, do, think, and feel when using websites, mobile applications, voice interfaces, AR, VR, wearables, and other digital products. The original research we'll be discussing in detail today was conducted as part of the Human-Centered Work Project, a hub of research-based insights, resources, and tools on redesigning work experiences that work for everyone. I'll now pass it on to Brenna, who will be introducing the project further and leading the conversation today. Great, thanks, Lynette. Hi, everybody. My name is Brenna, uh, they, she pronouns. I'm gonna introduce myself a little bit, give an overview of the work that we did, and then I'll introduce each of our wonderful panelists that we'll be talking with today. Um, so I'm a principal UX researcher here at Answer Lab. I've been at Answer Lab going on four years and I've been in the industry going on 10. And I absolutely love doing this type of work, this um, really foundational work where we dig into people's experiences and as a, a queer community member myself, this is very close to my heart. Um, basically, we can't really talk about this research without talking about our ERG, um, our employee resource group. And if you're unfamiliar with what those are, don't worry, I was unfamiliar with what it was too, basically until I started one at Answer Lab. Um, so our ERG is called Rainbow Lab. Um, it arose from the desire to do this type of research. So back in 2020, during um, you know the strong uprising for Black Lives and when the pandemic hit, we started looking into uh, human-centered work and how things affected people in the workplace. Um, and I was fortunate enough to work on one of those projects um, unpacking white supremacy in the workplace with BIPOC individuals. And that, you know, gave me the desire to, to learn more about the LGBTQ experience. Um, and I started actually at like a panel like this. I was um, at a, a Twitter panel and I saw one of my fellow answer labbers, Megan Sauter, um, and we were both like that Spider-Man meme, like you, you, wait, me, me too. Like we weren't really out at work at that point. And so we started talking about it and thinking about doing DEI research um, with the queer community in similar ways that we did um, it, with other human-centered work projects in 2020. And soon after a group of queer answer labbers, we began drafting a proposal for research. And, and as more folks joined into that, uh, you know, we started a Slack channel and that just blossomed into uh, Rainbow Lab. Uh, so it was a really grassroots um, starting process. Um, and, and we are thriving. Answer Lab and Rainbow Lab is one of my favorite things <laughs> in my life right now. Uh, so to get into a little bit more about the work that we did, next slide, please. Um, we did a really iterative process when we were looking at queer experiences in the workplace. We started with a literature review. Um, Emily Mosier and Marcus Hall, former answer labbers, worked on this portion where we looked at the landscape of what's happening, um, what has happened over time in, you know, American government, in different best practices, at workplaces, how things have changed and where we were at. Um, to help us build into the rest of the, the phases. So we did our first phase of internal benchmarking. Um, Billy Table led that. They are one of our panelists. They'll talk a little bit more about that, as well as Sabrina Mor De Morale. Um, it involved qualitative benchmarking study, exploring gaps that exist uh, for Answer Lab internally when it comes to corporate inclusion. 
it was different from the other phases uh, because we just looked at our own internal practices. We reviewed corporate documents that outlined policies such as, you know, employee handbooks, benefit packages, um, uh, curriculum for training materials, employee survey summaries, et cetera. Um, and we used an, we established a scorecard using the human rights campaign, as well as great place to work uh, to gauge how our organization did policy wise. If we were not just talking the talk, if we were walking the walk and we scored answer lab on four criteria categories. So workforce protections, inclusive benefits, inclusive culture and social responsibility, as well as responsible citizenship. And we overall succeeded, which was wonderful to see. Uh, but we also uncovered some limitations in our formal policies and trainings, um, such as our gender transition coverage and our health insurance, our dress code policy, and um, LGBTQ-focused leadership and training. And Answer Lab has since changed our health insurance, and they work very closely with our ERG Rainbow Lab to implement other meaningful changes as identified in this study. In round two, we did internal listening sessions um, with Michelle Wojcik and um, a few other answer labbers. Uh, Michelle will talk, she's one of our panelists here. She'll talk about the, the intricacies of doing internal research, uh, but we, we add depth to, and context to those benchmark findings. So we spoke to 12 LGBTQIA plus identifying employees, as well as nine allies about their thoughts and their experiences with Answer Lab's policies, culture, research practices. Um, we had we included Answer Labbers from many different departments and varying levels of seniority. And we also conducted individual contributor and manager only listening sessions. So there was some, some intricacies there to make sure that people were able to feel comfortable giving thoughtful feedback and uh, you know manage, feedback on management specific topics or individual contributor topics. Um, and in order to build rapport and create a space in which free expression could flourish, the researchers who conducted the listening sessions identified as members as those particular communities that they were speaking with. So LGBTQ researchers led those listening sessions and ally researchers led the ally listening sessions. And in round three, it was our biggest and longest uh, with the most data. We'll, we'll be hearing a lot from Kareem, who is on the line. Um, he led this round along with um, Billy and um, Eden Jackson and a few other answer labbers. But we conducted a 10-day diary study followed by 15 in-depth interviews our diary study had 34 participants from um, employees around the country. So we moved from doing our first two rounds of internal research, took those learnings and findings and expanded upon it to see how other queer employees in the American workplace were experiencing things. It really allowed us to collect rich data about the day-to-day -day experiences of the employees we spoke with and um, these in-depth interviews that we followed up with the uh, diary studies gave us time to dig in and get deep, deep understanding of our of some of our uh, participants' stories. And it was some of the most powerful and vulnerable conversations that our researchers have done. Um, and Kareem will talk much more about that. So without further ado, uh, next slide, please. I'd like to introduce these wonderful people I've already been talking about. So I'll pass it over to Billy. Hey, everyone. I'm Billy Table, they, them. I'm a UX strategist and former senior UX researcher at Answer Lab. Really excited to be here. Um, I worked in the tech and consulting industry for two years. And before Answer Lab, I was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Texas at Austin, where I researched and taught about LGBTQ plus health communication difficult conversations, message testing, and organizational change initiatives. I led phase one of this work, um, as Brenna mentioned, alongside my colleague, Brenna Del Moral, and the planning, phase, planning of phase three with my colleagues, Brenna, Kareem, Henry, Max, and Eden. Um, my favorite outcome across this work is seeing changes in action at my workplace and also hearing how folks are already finding the guidance that we've shared useful and impactful. Um, so I'll go ahead and pass it to Michelle to introduce herself. Thanks, Billy. Uh, my name is Michelle. She, her pronouns. Um, I'm a UX researcher here at Answer Lab. 
Um, and pri prior to joining Answer Lab, um, my PhD research centered on the victimization experiences of vulnerable populations, including youth and the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and I led the round two internal listening sessions along with my colleagues, Eden Jackson, uh, Marissa Putnam, and Joseph Friedman. And like Brenna said, these sessions captured the experiences of both queer and ally answer labbers. Um, and my favorite part of doing this work was to provide a space for my colleagues to voice their needs and discuss the changes they'd like to, uh, like to see within our workplace. Um, and with that, I will pass it to Kareem. Good morning, <clears throat> good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Kareem. I use he, him pronouns. I mean, throughout my research career, I've had the opportunity to work on inclusivity and accessibility projects, uh, social policy research, and lead internal research efforts at my former company just to understand junior level staff experiences and how to improve job satisfaction. I had the pleasure of leading the third round of this study, which focused on the diary study and the in depth interview with external employees. And we really were trying to understand daily sources of support and exhaustion for LGBTQIA plus employees, um, diving deeper into what compels or dissuades employees to be out in the workplace and to further cultivate um, LGBTQIA plus inclusion in the workplace. And I uh, just want to thank everyone who's been a part of this project, including Eden Jackson, Henny Harbour, and Max Simoleski, and, and so on. Great. Thanks, everybody. Next slide, please. Okay, well, let's get into this discussion. We have so much to cover. Um, we already have some articles and things published about these rounds on our website, too. So please make sure to visit answerlab.com slash HCW to find um, our reports and different documentation to help you through this process if you're interested in doing this yourself. So first off, uh, next slide. I'm curious, were there any specific methods or tools that were particularly effective for um, capturing such nuanced experiences that we have in our um, LGBTQ community? Um, I'd like to start, Michelle, you, you talked to you know, our colleagues here at Answer Lab, so I'm curious um, what you have. Yeah, so like I said, I led round two, which involved speaking to our Answer Lab colleagues. So during these listening sessions, or sometimes also referred to as focus groups, uh, we gave each of the participants a Google Doc worksheet um, to brain dump their thoughts to the question uh, during the session. So the moderator would read the question, pause for a few minutes to give everybody an opportunity to like think and reflect um, and write down their thoughts. And this gave everybody the chance to first think about what they're comfortable sharing, what they want to share, um, and also gave them the option to share their thoughts with the researcher because this worksheet would be available to the researcher after the uh, session without having to share with the whole group. Because, um, you know, it's, it's extra touchy because we all work together. Um, and with that, we also provided opportunities to stay anonymous during the session. So um, some of our colleagues called in using avatars and only interacted with the focus group uh, through the worksheet or through the chat. And again, all of this was just to make sure everybody could speak freely without fear of, of repercussion. Great. Right. Yeah, I love how we set it up so that people could be really comfortable and feel safe so that we could get some really honest, open feedback. I know we we uncovered a lot of things during that that round. Um, Kareem, what about what about during the diary study or the the interviews that the round three that you led? Yeah, so using a diary followed by in-depth interviews really allowed us to capture these day-to-day -day fluctuations and employees' behaviors, their da um, daily sources of support, exhaustion, those workplace interactions. And then by doing those in-depth interviews, we were able to dive deeper into the themes that came up in the diary. So as we mentioned earlier, we had a 10-day diary with 34 participants, so we're getting a lots of data there. Um, it's a mix of sexual orientation, gender identity, racial and ethnic backgrounds, educations, tenures. I could go on. There are lots of different <laughs> nuanced uh, identities there. And that really helped us capture a broad range of experiences while also finding themes across those individual experiences. So, for example, our diary uncovered that on average, employees experience exhaustion of um, one out of six days. Um, so we are able to capture this quantitative data, but then also through capture this more qualitative data, 
um, sort of understanding, well, what are those sources of exhaustion? Um, and, you know, we were able to learn about more about um, misgendering, harassment, discrimination, and, and then even conducting those um, in-depth interviews after our diary studies, it again, helped us dive deeper into um, key areas, one being ERGs, and we'll hear a little bit more about that later. Um, but during the diary phase, we learned that 92% of employees we spoke with whose company had an LGBTQIA plus ERG participated in those ERGs. So that really tells us how powerful ERGs can be. And then during the interviews, uh, we were able to ask specific questions about ERG structures, programming, um, their role in the organization that adds color to these numbers, and then helps us understand what ERGs mean to participants. I, one participant mentioned that an ERG is their lifeline. And, and that was really powerful that we were able to get through those in-depth interviews. Yeah, ERGs are so important. I mean, we've seen that here at, at Answer Lab. I, I loved hearing uh, this really, really robust feedback across the country, right? Like to know that it's like not just us, right? ERGs are, are super important. Um, great. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm curious also, how did you ensure that the research was inclusive and representative? You know, Kareem, you talked about all these different identities and intersections and, and things. So how did, um, Billy, can you talk a little bit about, I know you really set up round three and, and had a lot to do with um, the planning kind of across the uh, project with me. So can, can you talk about how you made sure that this was inclusive and representative of the queer community? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's two things that come to mind. Um, so first, we were really thoughtful when, when it came to diary segmentation, as well as our onboarding process. So with the segmentation, we didn't want to just say, let's get 35 LGBTQ plus people, um, because we wanted meaningful representation of each letter of the alphabet, so to speak. Um, I think we have it. Do we have a slide for the next slide? Yes. Okay. Um, so we had slightly more cis, cisgender LGB people because there's a higher percentage uh, represented nationally, but we also defined here binary trans, so trans women and trans men and non-binary folks as segment groups. Um, and so related to our recruitment process, we wanted our participants to know we're a team of LGBTQ plus people doing this work. We wanted them to see our faces, hear our voices. So we sent along a video introducing ourselves and the study. And we had open Q&A sessions before the diary started for participants to attend and they can meet the researchers and fully feel comfortable sharing their day-to-day -day workplace experiences. And so, you know, from the, you know, planning to the execution and, and uh, all these different steps in between, we really wanted to um, be inclusive and try and just make folks feel as comfortable as possible. It's so special the way that you crafted uh, the the onboarding for the diary study for the participants. I absolutely love that there was a deck that explained, you know, what was really what we were looking for, like what a good um, submission would be versus a uh, um, less savory submission, and then also just like telling everybody, you know, hey, we're queer too. Like you can be comfortable. We understand. Um, we're we're in it for the right reasons, right? It 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 was that's something I think that was really really special about this particular project, um, and I think that's a wonderful takeaway. Um, whenever you're working with marginalized communities or sensitive topics, right? You don't just wanna get somebody in an interview and be like, surprise, we're talking about your sexual identity, <laughs> right? So making sure that people were able to opt in and consent to discussing these things and know that that we're really here to, to listen and, and learn, uh, that, was, that was beautiful. So thank you for that. Um, Michelle, in terms of working with people that we work with, that can bring up a whole other um, type of need for inclusivity, inclusivity and, and representation. Um, next slide and tossing it over to M Michelle. Yeah, thanks, Brenna. So you're right. It was especially important given that the researchers and the participants um, all work together here at Answer Lab. So we had to take extra precautions to ensure that everyone felt safe 
uh, participating in our listening sessions. So um, first we conducted uh, individual level contributor and manager only um, ally listening sessions. And that was to prevent anybody from being in the same focus group as their boss, you know, so they can speak to uh, among a group of equals, share thoughtfully and freely without any fear of having to, you know, later have a conversation with their, their boss who's in the same room. Um, and we also conducted manager only um, listening sessions. So managers can speak about topics that are most important to them. and didn't feel like they had to also, you know, engage in, in listening to their direct reports. So the manager's ally session focused on things like improving training materials and, and leadership training opportunities. Um, and also to build rapport and create a space in which participants could freely speak and, and feel safe. Um, the researchers who conducted the listening sessions all identified as members of the community they were speaking with. So queer researchers led queer listening sessions and ally researchers led ally listening sessions. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's something that I didn't really talk about too much when I was discussing the project overall, but all of the leads and everybody that was working on this project, um, we wanted to make sure aligned with the, the phase and the, the part of the project. Um, so primarily, we had a whole team of, of queer researchers and um, project managers and, and uh, research managers helping out on this. It was really, really amazing. And then when we brought in, um, in round two was when we turned towards allies, we made sure to have allies there too. So that was, that was really um, imperative, I think, here. Um, Kareem, what about in, uh, oh, actually, sorry, next slide. <laughs> New question, <laughs> which we will get to cream for. Um, so I know there were some challenges um, and, and specific considerations that we needed to take in analyzing and interpreting these findings. And that's why I wanted to talk to Kareem because there were so, you know, 34 diary participants across so many different intersections of life. Um, I'm curious how you handled that. Yeah, so in round three, at the end of each day, again, we're doing a diary. We're asking employees to share whether they've experienced discomfort or exhaustion at work. And again, prior to the study and even in the prompts themselves, we're telling participants that we want you to share as much or as little as you're comfortable um, with us, given that a lot of these experiences can be painful to reflect on. Um, and as Billy mentioned, we have those introductions. We have the study deck. Um, and I think that really helps participants uh, feel comfortable that they could share, um, you know, what was going on in their lives. And it's a good feeling when you can get participants to feel comfortable sharing those experiences, but you don't know what might come your way. Uh, so I remember the first day of the study, um, just reading through your diary entries, uh, there was an employee who wrote about an instance of sexual misconduct in the workplace. And in instances like this, it's, it was important for my team and um, I to come together and discuss the, how to best approach these situations with compassion and care and sort of understand how we can best be supportive. So for example, you know, I spoke with my colleague Max and something we did was just figure out um, if there are any resources we could point participants to, of course, with their permission. Um, so that that's one of the challenges that uh, when you're asking about, um, when you're asking for participants to be vulnerable, to be raw, to talk about these experiences of discomfort, um, anything can come up in these diaries and it, it's best that you have a team that can support you through these uh, through these uh, studies but also know how to um, respond again with care and compassion. Oh, wonderful, Kareem. Thank you. Yeah, I know I've conducted uh, research in the queer community myself as well and diary studies can be particularly vulnerable. So, you know, having um, having my colleagues and friends at work that I can lean on and just talk about and be like, oh man, this this really kind of triggered me. Like, can we talk about this? I could use some support. And having that type of relationship with um, folks on this project, I think was really imperative to, you know, support our own mental health and uh, to be able to support our participants as well. So, um, Michelle, what about with talking to folks that work here about these types of things? How, how, what type of challenges or considerations did you take? Yeah, it, everything you just said, Brenna, it, it's so important to have emotional support when doing this type of work, especially 
you know, qualitative research, whether it's listening sessions or diary studies is very personal just in its nature. And especially when you identify with the community that you're, you're researching. Um, so it's emotionally heavy and you really have to be mentally prepared to do this work and enter into the listening session and give yourself the space to process and perhaps even, you know, grieve and heal as a group. Um, and, and having that strong organizational support system when you need to do brief, when you need to step away, or we just need to, you know, recognize something that is emotionally taxing is, is so critical when doing this work. Yeah, absolutely. And we can kind of extrapolate this out, not just doing, you know, research with your own community, but if you're working on research projects that are just sensitive topics in general, they can be heavy. You know, it's okay to pause with your participants and say, okay, did you want to take a breath together, are you okay, right? Sometimes it's okay to break that fourth wall, I think, and and make sure that everybody feels supported and then make sure to give yourself time at the end, whatever you do, if you need to go pet your dog or take a walk, things like that. Um, this, you know, heavy work can be heavy, right? Great, thanks for sharing that, y'all. Um, I wanna know, were there any in unexpected discoveries or unique perspectives that uh, participants shared or that came up while you were doing this research? I'm just gonna open this for everybody. Michelle, I see you're unmuted. Did you have a thought? <laughs> yeah, so I was surprised to hear through our listening sessions that LGBTQIA plus employees wanted an explicit dress code. It kind of goes against um, some of our tradition, like our current understandings of that we don't want to be boxed into a dress code. But to some, the current use your best judgment approach did signal that there was an invisible line uh, that could be crossed. So while no one wanted a rigid, and especially no one wanted a, a rigid gender dress code. Some did want it explicitly in the employee handbook that come as you are, appear as you are, um, was the official policy. And, and that just really shows the importance of, you know, using clear language in workplace policies, even if the policy is, you know, we're supportive of however you choose to present yourself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Billy or Kareem, did you have any unique perspectives that you found throughout? All right, well, for the sake of time, let's just head on to the next slide here. This one's a pretty exciting one, I think. Um, so what were the specific recommendations for how companies can improve the experiences of LGBTQIA plus employees? What were the findings? Next slide, please. Awesome. So. I just want to take a second to pause so that everybody can kind of read through this here. We found some really, really powerful insights. Let's start with Kareem. Um, which ones yeah. really resonated with you? Yeah, so I, I was starting to think about the question you asked previously about unexpected discoveries and um, or unique perspectives. And I think going through the diary and across the different phases, Something that kept coming up again and again was these gaps in trainings um, and a need to equip allies with skills to show up for their colleagues. Um, we often hear that, you know, employees want to do and say the right thing, but they're not sure how to do those things or what to do in those situations and end up saying nothing. Um, and I think uh, even during your diary, I learned that a lot of participants, a lot of employees, there are a lot of these uh, sort of standard check the box annual sensitivity trainings, and it doesn't necessarily go beyond that. And I really think there's an opportunity to provide um, employees with sort of the practice to speak up um, as an advocate or as, as an ally. I think there's uh, opportunities to develop more guidelines around ending harmful conversations. And I think there's really a need for more comprehensive training with trans inclusive information that covers gender identity and sexual orientation on a deeper level that talks about intersectional marginalized identity and so on in meaningful ways that sort of go beyond the, okay, you have your training, it's due on July 15th and then it's due the next July 15th. So yeah, I think here sort of more um, robust, comprehensive um, training. Oh, absolutely. And thinking about being in the UX industry too, I think this is, I don't, I don't want to say more crucial, but, you know, we're dealing with the public and we're talking to 
um, folks that we may or may not know if they're out or if they're trans, right? This is like kind of an invisible thing. So having the training to know how to show up for people just in general when you're conducting interview sessions or working with different stakeholders or, uh, you know, learning how to stand up for uh, the LGBTQ community if you have a finding in your research, right? So, uh, wow, that's super powerful. What about you, Michelle? Yeah, so a big one was just making sure that the recruitment materials for, for new applicants are gender inclusive. That really serves as the starting point as it signals the inclusive culture of an organization. And I know currently our Answer Lab web, web, uh, website showcases a lot of its uh, our human-centered work. And I know that that was an important and a deciding factor for a lot of us who currently work here when we were making the decision to submit an application. So it's a relatively low lift, but it goes a long way in signaling the uh, inclusive culture of the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. I run some of our onboarding trainings, and I noticed that once I um, started being gender inclusive and like being out, I guess, like that was a transition for me, like at, at uh, Answer Lab currently was really being out at the workplace. And I, I noticed that as we started being more inclusive in our culture and on our website, we started getting more diverse applicants and really powerful, um, you know, experiences from our different employees, which has really, really improved our workplace uh, on so many levels. I mean, I could go on and on, uh, but I want to hear from Billy. <laughs> no, I can, I'll, I would definitely ditto that. Um, uh, that was one of the reasons why I en ended up coming to work at Answer Lab and, um, and then meeting Brenna and onboarding. I was like, oh, there's more of us here. Like it was great, um, but yeah. So I mean, looking at this list, um, if I had to pick one of these that that was most impactful to me, um, it it would be the benefits focused one. Um, so you know, the part of the project that that I led um, involved auditing our policies and benefits and things like that, and I, we ended up changing our healthcare benefits to be more trans inclusive. Um, and it's one that I personally have benefited from as well. Um, our healthcare plan didn't uniformly cover gender affirming care, uh, like hormone therapies. So we switched to one that did. And in addition to offsetting high costs of gender transition, uh, it's certainly helpful when companies are able to document the processes of how to use these benefits and develop guidelines of how to navigate the complexities of our insurance, um, explain what kinds of resources are available and to assist employees through that. Um, because insurance is so complicated and um, being able to say like, okay, I know we have these benefits and it's laid out here how to use them is just really important and demonstrates a lot of care. And so um, Answer Lab was, that was one of the biggest and first changes that that um, we did. And so I'm really thankful for that. Yeah, that was so powerful to, um, you know, wrap up our first round of research and, and do a readout with our, our CEO and founder, Amy, and uh, the the passion that she brought and the, the quickness that this happened. I feel like we did the readout um, for like a month before our benefit packages were up for renewal. Like, I think, it, what is it, November, where everybody has to like sign up again. It was, it happened so quickly and it was so impactful and felt really validating for this type of research. So, wow, thanks for sharing that, Billy. Um, and I, you know, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about this here too. Um, I'm the, the founding member um, and one of our co-chairs along with Billy um, of our ERG. And that was something that I found really interesting uh, and validating was to hear, um, you know, both in our literature reviews and from our internal employees and then from external folks who work, you know, in tons of different um, industries across the states that ERGs are such a powerful way to connect with people. Um, something that was kind of interesting that came out of our diary study and interviews was people pointing out when ERGs went wrong, it really created a worse experience. So it's it's very important for 
uh, the companies to help support these ERGs, um, you know, LGBTQ, of course, that's what we're talking about, but there's a plethora of other ERGs that um, that pop up, you know, it's usually based on identity and, and connection and intersection. Um, here at Answer Lab, you know, our ERG has been instrumental in driving policy on changes, like Billy was talking about, around benefits. Um, we also organize a lot of social events. Um, we're, we're running a whole bunch of pride things right now in, in June, um, but we, we do things all year and it's, it's a place for us to connect. And it's, it's just really empowering and, and, and beautiful. We've even had some folks um, in Rainbow Lab talk about how this is the first place they've ever been able to be out. So not even just in their personal life, but being at, um, at Answer Lab and feeling comfortable, um, you know, coming out and, and then people saying that this is their first time ever being out at work. Um, and it's so important to be comfortable and to be authentic. You know, we spend so much time at work, <laughs> right? So being able to be ourselves and not having to mask things and not having to, to hide or worry about, um, you know, a lot of the findings um, of, of discomfort and, and things from our diary study of, you know, being misgendered or um, having somebody use the wrong pronouns on purpose, you know, microaggressions, macroaggressions, like, I don't feel like we have to worry about that at Answer Lab. And that is in part because of our um, ERG and our, our support and education around this type of thing. So. Yeah, really great, uh, really, really great findings. These are impactful steps companies can make. I do see a question in the chat about um, these findings and if they were reviewed by our interviewees. And so we did have um, folks in round, round three. So we did show them all of our reports and everything before we published them and gave them a chance to give feedback. Um, so yes. Excellent. All right. Well, we are coming up on time. I believe we have just a couple more questions. So let's move on to the next slide here. And I'm curious what kind of policies or experiences had a significant impact on fostering an inclusive workplace for LGBTQIA plus individuals. And I'm just going to ask that directly to Kareem since he spoke with so many people across the country. Yeah, and um, I think Billy started alluding to this, but I had the, um, based on their personal experience, but I had the pleasure of speaking with um, an employee who learned early on in their onboarding experience that their jobs, health insurance covered gender affirming care up to a certain amount of um, money in a calendar year. And I just want to share a quote from the participant where they said, this made me feel valued. I appreciated that it was a specific benefit rather than something marketed as LGBTQIA plus health care. Um, it's more like, no, you're trans, we will help you transition, we care about you. Um, and this is coming from a participant who previously worked at a another uh, another company where they faced constant microaggression, where they um, weren't really comfortable coming out after to other people after those microaggressions. So that was very heartwarming uh, to hear. And then just another quick one, just in the interest of time, is uh, we have several employees talk about um, working at companies that encourage sharing pronouns, whether it's on Slack, Zoom, and during introductions. And again, just sharing another quote from an employee that it's nice to go into a workplace knowing I'm not the only trans person and that there are other openly queer and trans employees, especially at all levels. When my cisgender employee, uh, colleagues introduce themselves with pr pronouns, it's a norm, it's a practice. You don't assume pronouns with looks. This helps me not stick out or be othered. So having a policy around pronouns can really help foster an inclusive workplace, especially for trans and non-binary employees. As a trans non-binary employee, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kareem. Thank you for sharing that. I love um, hearing like these individual stories. It really brings everything to life. You know, you can have stats and slides and everything, but when you hear directly about people's experiences, it's so it's so powerful. So, all right. Well, final thoughts. Next slide here. Um, Billy, let's start with you. What advice would you give to organizations or individuals seeking to create a more inclusive work environment for queer folks? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I know folks are probably thinking maybe my workplace could do better supporting LGBTQ plus people or how do I broach that with my manager, my teams, my CEO. Um, and I would say one place to start is to ask about or 
or see if you can lead or see if there's teams within the company who would lead some foundational research. Um, and if there's, if there's any research at all, focus on diversity and inclusion, um, because that can begin to highlight what areas need attention, such as like, do managers need trainings? What are healthcare benefits look like? Um, like, do we need to go in and address the microaggressions, how to handle those, how to stand up and be an ally? Um, and so it's important to, to look at policies, benefits, codif codified procedures, like we've talked about dress code policies, anti-discrimination policies, to examine whether a company may be leaving, leaving somebody out in the process. Um, I also want to say here, please reach out to us. We're here to help if you want to talk about ways to reach out to your company's leadership, how to start those conversations, how to design this kind of research, um, because I know we've talked about a lot of things, a lot of findings, a lot of um, uh, background, but I also would love to say like we're available um, for, for chatting and brainstorming. So, um, yeah. Yeah, awesome. I know. Uh we'll be sending out follow-up emails with additional resources and ways to get in contact with us as well. Thanks, Billy. Uh, Michelle, what, what is, uh, what's your final thought here? Yeah, I think that a starting point for companies looking to do this work is to just talk to your employees. You know, you can't know what policies could be improved or what needs uh, your uh, employees have if you don't ask. So provide opportunities for queer employees to voice their needs, whether it's through the listening sessions like what we did, or even just an anonymous uh, pulse check survey. Um, and with that, we do have um, the listening session guide that we used um, in our work published on our website, and we're going to send it out um, after this webinar as well, in case you want to use it as a, a starting point for your own work. Your own work. Awesome. Thanks for putting that together, Michelle. Uh, Kareem, what's your uh, final thought? What advice would you give? Yeah, I think Billy and Michelle wrapped this up very well, but I think my big takeaway is just to continue asking questions to take stock of your organization and uh, along the way of an employee's journey, all the way from recruitment all to retention. Um, are employees aware of the resources and protections available to them during onboarding? Um, are the recruitment practices inclusive of LGBTQIA plus um, employees? Um, is it clear what the DEI initiatives are and how the company is advancing those? So I think it's um, important to encourage those in leadership and throughout the organization to keep asking questions. Great. What's good advice, y'all? We learned so much with this. Um, it, it, we, I feel like we got the tip of the iceberg here, right? So um, I see some questions coming in uh, through our Q and A. Um, before we get to those, I just wanted to point out that we're really today we focused on organizational findings, and um, if you uh, have a chance to look at our full report, there's a whole section on this as well as findings for individuals who are in the workplace. So today we just really focused on the organizational aspect, and there are even more things that you can dig into and learn about and discover on what you can do as an individual in the workplace. Um, all in that uh, amazing and long report. <laughs> there were so many findings. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so one of the questions that we had come in that I want to ask our panelists here um, was, what are the best ways to be inclusive in words and actions? So kind of getting a little bit into that individual um, aspect. I think um, just to add some nuance to talking about like pronouns and how we were talking about how a policy is important, I think that within that policy, it shouldn't be mandatory to include pronouns just because there could be some employees who aren't out and they don't want to misgender themselves um, or they're, um, they are, are questioning and they're not sure which pronouns to use. And so uh, if, if it's kind of a requirement and when everybody's going around sharing their pronouns, if somebody doesn't include theirs, skip it, but making sure everybody knows that, that it is a recommended, a strongly recommended practice can be, um, it, it helps 
folks feel included. It helps people not feel like they stick out. Um, so that would be one thing that I wanted to bring up. Yeah, absolutely. I know, like, I feel like my pronouns change constantly or like are different if I'm in different areas. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes I don't want to share them. Right. So um, I would say like kind of adding on to that is if you're in, you know, a meeting or talking with folks um, outside of, I mean, anywhere, if you notice that somebody's being misgendered, um, speak up for them. I can say as somebody who gets misgendered on a daily basis, it's, you know, it's like death by a thousand cuts. I don't want to talk about it all the time. I don't want to um, always have to say, I prefer they or, you know, something like that. Um, so if, if you do hear that happening, um, it's always helpful, I know, for myself when somebody else, uh, you know, helps me out with that. Um, one of the questions that we got in the live chat was how easy or difficult was it to gain buy-in from Answer Lab's leadership for this project? Um, and how long did that take? Um, Billy, I know that you really helped me with setting this up and I'm, I, I'm the one that really spearheaded this, but um, did you have any thoughts or did you want to talk with me about that? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing that came to mind um was that we it, it's impossible for one person to say we're gonna make our organization more inclusive it has to be you have to tell leadership sometimes it's the business case meaning uh this it, it, being more inclusive leads to more retention it leads to higher satisfaction leads to more productivity sometimes it's um it's you know, really empowering people in multiple roles. So, so um, different departments, different areas, different, um, uh, uh, like we, for here we had researchers and managers and leadership and project managers and strategists. We had folks from every area who were advocating for this kind of work. And so I think that together um, that made it a, a, a force of yeah and, yeah <laughs> yeah it took a while too right um so i think uh i started writing the research plan back in january of 2021 um so we had wrapped up our first rounds of the hcw work um in 2020 and um it took a while but i would say like if you want to do this type of work write the plan get it on paper because I was a squeaky wheel. Anybody that would listen to me talk about wanting to do this work or, or things like that. Like I was telling anybody and everybody, making sure my managers were aware of it, um, making sure anytime I had the chance to talk with um, higher level management or executives that, uh, you know, I was really interested in doing this type of work. And then finally in 2022, when our um, objectives and key results goals were defined, this aligned right with one of those. So it was, um, it, it, I don't know if it was chicken or the egg because, you know, we had been talking about doing it a lot. So it was like planting the seeds in people's brains um, or if like that was a goal that like the business saw and then they were like, oh yeah, Brenna and the, the team are already like, they have something on paper. So it was really easy to already have this plan laid out to like um, usher it in once we got official, um, funding and buy-in. So I would say like the first step would be to just, you know, get together with some other folks and start actually writing up a plan um, for what you want to do. All right. Well, uh, we are about five minutes over. So thank you so much, everybody, for sticking around for this this uh, robust conversation and these these question and answers. Uh, we didn't get to every single question that came through, um, but I believe we will be including those um, in a follow up as well. Um, and yeah, we also have so much um, on our website already for y'all to dig into. So thank you so much. I want to toss it back over. Well, thank you to the to the panelists for sharing everything. Thank you, Billy and Michelle and, and Kareem. It's been a pleasure to work with y'all. Um, back over to Lynette. Yes, thank you, team. Thank you for the great conversation today. And thank you everyone for attending. As Brenda mentioned, we will be sending out um, links to these additional resources as well as a recording. 
of this webinar in case you want to go back and rewatch it. So make sure to keep an eye on your inbox. And if you want some more information, you can also visit us at answerlab.com hcw. Thank you again, everyone, for attending, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, y'all. Happy Pride.